Will you pray with me? Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Did you all have a good Thanksgiving? It was, it was great to sleep in a little bit. That's not very often that that happens. That was really good. And then I had a bunch of family that all got together in Denton. And uh, it was wonderful to see people we hadn't seen in a long time. Half the family that was there got sick with a stomach bug. But it wasn't my part of the family. So, I know that's terrible. To, to, I shouldn't, but oh. I was so glad to not have everybody puking. I'm just, uh, so thank you, Thanksgiving. It was, that, was, that was a small mercy. So I hope you guys all had a good time, that there was family, that there were things you liked in your Thanksgiving. I'm glad you're back here safely. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, which is the start of the church calendar. In the church year, this is where it all begins. And so we're waiting. We're waiting on the birth of the child. We're waiting uh, for God to be with us. It's a beautiful, sacred time. And here at Genesis, we are focusing on some of the key ideas from the, um, the story of the nativity to talk about how it's a wonderful life when we show some of these things. So we're showing the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, tonight, as I had mentioned, at five. And I hope you'll come. Um, it's a classic for a reason. I mean, have all of you seen it? Raise your hands if you've seen it. Some people haven't. Okay. When, I, when Steve and I first got married, he thought it was this treacly sweet kind of thing. And uh, if, you've, if you've seen it, you know it's not. It's very dark and, and, and yet very real and hopeful. So come see it because, again, some of the ideas that we're going to be looking at all through the season are really shown there. The main character, George Bailey, is a person who shows so much grace. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at grace, especially through the lens of Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. I want to take a second, though. Grace is one of those words that we use all the time. Uh, it's churchy words, but a lot of people may not understand what that is. So we're using Joseph again to unpack that. The scripture tells us some amazing things about him. He responded to this situation in ways that a lot of men of his time would not have. In fact, I think very few men of his time would have reacted the way that he did. I mean, imagine it even now. You're engaged. Now, back then, engagement was a little bit different. It was a very formal process that was uh, part of a contract. You had to go to court to have it broken. It was, it was a big deal. Then when the couple, you know, I'm echoing. Are y'all hearing me echo, or is it just me? Okay, I won't worry about it. Um, when the couple got old enough to get married, they would get married, but they could be engaged from the time they were really small. But it was a very big deal to be engaged. So Joseph and Mary were engaged, and then she goes to him and tells him that she's pregnant. He knows that it's not his baby. So that sounds like something that happens all the time, even in our day. What would a young man do? I think nowadays... You could probably expect there to be yelling and anger, the young man feeling like he's been made a fool of. He might go on Facebook and shame her. There was, there was no Facebook back then, but it was definitely something he could do to go tell everybody what she had done so that he could feel right about that, about how he had been done unfairly. But he didn't do any of those things. He decided that he, he wasn't going to marry her. He was going to put her aside, but he was going to do it quietly to preserve her dignity. And then he had this dream that he should marry her and name the child Jesus. And he listened to the dream. Again, he didn't have to. And a lot of times you could wake up from a dream and think, well, you know, that's just nutty. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But instead... He married her and stood by her and took care of her and was Jesus' dad. But 
had he gone to the Bible, as a Jewish man, he would have known his Bible, he would have known his scriptures very, very well. Had he gone to the Bible, there was a definite prescription for what he should do. And that was he should have her taken outside the city and stoned to death. So when you think about what he would have been justified in doing versus what he did do, you see this just incredible grace and love and compassion. So when we talk about grace, we're talking about God's amazing love for us that comes flowing to us even when we don't deserve it. Maybe especially when we don't, but all the time, this love of God is flowing through us and to us. That's what it's about. And so the idea with today is how are our lives better when we show grace? It's pretty easy to see how our lives are better because of God's grace for us. But what we're saying is that our lives are actually more wonderful when we're the ones who show grace. And if you've ever experienced that, that choice to love, it's one of those things that's hard to talk about in words until you've experienced it. It's the difference between getting harder and tighter versus being more open and expansive and love flowing more and kindness flowing more and it will qualitatively change your life entirely to be a person who shows grace and gives grace. One of the greatest preachers who ever lived was this guy, Fred Craddock, and he talks about Joseph in one of his sermons, and he says that the cool thing about Joseph was that he knew that you can't just read the Bible. You have to read it through a lens of God's amazing love and compassion, and that's what Joseph did. He knew the character of God, and so he knew that even though it said stoner to death, that that wasn't right, that wasn't true of God. And so he acted differently. And then his life was blessed and changed because of it. These days, I see so many people who are doing unbelievable, hateful things in the name of God. And I'm not talking just about Muslim extremists. I mean, we see Christians doing amazingly hateful, horrible things in the name of God. And so I think we need to also always remember to view our scriptures through a lens of compassion. And if we are ever using our faith as a basis for hating or excluding or doing violence to any of those things, we are off track. So just this past Friday, a man went into the Planned Parenthood in Colorado Springs and opened fire. And we keep hearing about these things all the time. But here was another one on Friday. And we will probably find out that he felt this righteous sense of what was right. And he was the one that knew it. And so he could go in with a gun. And I will tell you that that is wrong. Pretty easy, obvious one on that. But it can be lesser things too. In the Ten Commandments, it tells us, do not take the Lord's name in vain. And I grew up thinking that meant don't cuss. Did some of y'all? I don't know. But it was like there's certain, you don't use the God's name with, with profanity. You know what? That's not actually what it meant. What it actually meant was don't say that what you're doing is God's will unless you are very, very certain that this is what God is willing. And one way you can tell if it's God's will or if it's something else is if it's hateful or it is exclusionary or if it hurts other people in any way, you are wrong. It's not God's will. So we see this stuff all the time. You know what, as United Methodists, we don't want to judge. And, and, and that's a, probably a good grace-filled thing is to, you know, I don't know, I don't want to judge. And so sometimes we don't speak out. But there are times when I think we can. There's a pastor in Arizona who is getting a lot of media. Anytime a Christian is a nut, they get a lot of media and, and can give Christians a bad name really easily. But this guy says that anyone who is gay should be killed and they will never come into his church. He will never allow a person, a gay or lesbian person, to come into his church. And he's getting a lot of attention. Well, I can tell you that he is wrong. 
He is wrong in his reading of the scripture because he's not reading it through a lens of God's compassion and love. He's wrong because what he's saying is hurtful to other people. He's wrong because it's exclusionary. Now that doesn't mean that I'm going to hate him because that's our call too. Are we loving other people? It is, that's a hard one. But I'm not going to hate him. I won't do that. I'm just not going to. What I can do is hope that he has some kind of crazy Damascus Road experience like Paul did that drives him to his knees and turns him around in his thinking and that he can use that pulpit to have a pretty powerful testimony of this is what I used to think and I have been shown that I was wrong. Because when there are people that are taking these actions that hurt other people, that has nothing to do with the love of Jesus Christ or the character of God. Nothing. And so we have to always keep looking. Are we being loving and compassionate people? Are we loving even when it's really, really hard? Are we welcoming the stranger? Are we doing our best to love God and love our neighbor? And keep looking in that. And it is easy, especially when people are intolerant for me to start to want to hate them, and then I'm wrong again, right? So we, but we still have to be able to say, that's not the Christian faith. That's not what Jesus Christ talked about. Because over and over and over again, he was always all grace, always reaching out across boundaries, always reaching out to the people who were excluded and bringing them back in. And our lives get better when we live in alignment with all of that. One example of grace is when we forgive. A lot of times people have said that when you forgive somebody, it's actually you that has the biggest benefit. And I bet some of you have experienced that. You can hold on to a grudge. And I've had people, some of you heard me talk about this before, I've had people say, but I have to keep living my life small, whatever it is. I have to keep doing this. I have to keep being angry or else he will have gotten away with it. Well, you know what? 99% of the time, he is just driving off with the new woman or whatever it is and he has no, he's already fine. He's fine. He's gotten away with it and you're the only one that's holding on to something that's causing your life to coil in on itself and be harder and smaller. So when you forgive someone, there's this tremendous freedom that you experience. And you know what? Sometimes people can't handle the grace. They're feeling so horrible about what they did, or they're feeling so unworthy. But the grace is like seeds that can start to grow in them. And then God can do God's work of helping them realize they do have worth and they are a person of value and get them to the point where they can forgive themselves. So one of the greatest ways that we can show grace is when we forgive. Like the young man in this video that we're gonna show. I remember my, my uh, you know, my stepfather, you know, would beat me and he, you know, he would beat me with extension cords and, and, and hangers and, pieces of wood and all kinds of stuff and you know after every beating he would tell me you know it hurt me more than it hurt you and you know I only did it because I love you it was kind of you know it communicated the wrong message to me about what love was so for many years you know I thought that love was supposed to hurt and um I hurt everyone that I loved and I measured love by how much pain someone would take from me. Um, and it wasn't until I came to prison in an environment that is devoid of love that I began to have some sort of understanding about what it actually was and was not. And I met someone, um, and she gave me my first real insight into what love was because she saw past my conditions 
and the fact that I was in prison with a life sentence for murder, not, and not only for murder, but for doing the worst kind of murder that a man can do, murdering a woman and a child. And it was Agnes, the mother and grandmother of Patricia and Chris, the woman and child that I murdered, who gave me my best lesson about love because by all rights, she should hate me. But she didn't. And over the course of time and through the journey that we took, <laughs> that's been pretty amazing. She gave me love and <clears throat> She taught me what it was. Grace. Unwarranted, undeserved. Love. Our world right now is so filled with fear and fear makes people hate because they want to feel a sense of control. We have people that want to feel better than. And sometimes our forgiveness makes us look vulnerable, makes us feel vulnerable. But Jesus kept saying that our power is in our weakness. So when we choose to love and we choose to forgive and we choose it over and over again, even though people don't necessarily deserve it, our lives are transformed. And then the love that is shown transforms other people in our path. We are the light. And so we keep on loving. And when you feel your heart getting hard because of something that has happened, some sense of fear, or some sense of betrayal, breathe into that and know that Jesus is with you and it is our job to keep loving and to keep sending that love out into this whole broken, dark world and be the light. Will you pray with me? Loving God, oh, you shower us with so much grace. In our gratitude to you, help us to also be people who shower others with grace. Teach us to forgive. And when we are forgiven, let us receive that love and grace. Help us to know that any act of kindness or mercy actually makes our lives better. Let us be salt and light for you, Lord. Amen. <laughs>